This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Paul Bloom. He's a psychologist. His book, Psych, The Story of the Human Mind. Paul has taken a very complicated, deep topic that goes on and on and on. There have been textbooks upon textbooks written, but Paul has tried to reduce this topic to something where us mere mortals can take advantage, jump in, and walk away with some insights. And you might be saying to yourself, what benefit ultimately is there for me? I think it's about happiness. It's a topic that's come up on this podcast many times. If you can take something away from the thinking process, the understanding of our mind that a guy like Paul Bloom can share with you to get you to a place of happiness, more happiness, then it's worth it. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my conversation today with Paul Bloom. The story of the human mind, what's really interesting about that subtitle of your book, the main title being Psych, is it's not the story of the human brain. And I thought that'd be a great place to jump off with you just as a foundational thought from you. And look, your book is diverse. We're only going to touch on topics today, enough to bring people into the thinking and your mindset and what you can deliver in terms of an education to people on this topic. But let's start there for a moment. This opening question, you could probably talk for the next four hours, five hours, maybe weeks, not months, if years, distinguishing between the mind and the brain. The floor is yours. I like the question. I'm not going to talk for months or years. I'll just try to give a snappy answer to that. But it's a, it's a great question because I would have murdered my editor and I have a great editor. But if she proposed changing to the brain, sells more brains, that's great. I would have said absolutely not. The reason for this is interesting, I think. There is no doubt. I make this argument at the very beginning of my book in some detail. I think one of the great revolutions in the study of the mind is the mind is the brain. There's an intuitive belief, a popular belief, and an immaterial soul that does the thinking. I think psychology has killed that. I think everything we do, our most intimate aspects of mental life, is all done in our brain. But the study of all of this is typically best done on a higher level. Most of what we know of memory and personality and language mental disorders and all of this doesn't work by studying the brain. It works by studying how people think, mental structures, computational mechanisms. All of these are eventually the properties of neural machinery. But studying the neural machinery often doesn't help as much. I'm candid when studies with fMRI and other methods reveal secrets of the mind. But for the most part, we're better off developing theories that work at a higher level. And there's all sorts of analogies. If you want to know how a car works, You don't study the quantum mechanics of the car. You study its carburetor and its circuitry, and now more and more it's electronics. There's a certain level of explanation. For the mind, I think psychology is the best level. Before we start to unpack, let me take it to you for a moment as a starting point. Why you? This is a compound question. Why you? Where's the curiosity from? Where did this all start to get to the point where you are delivering a work like this? Take me to a point in time. When did you get the itch? How did this happen? I've always had broad interests. That sounds like a boast, but I'll qualify it then by saying one of my weaknesses as a scholar is I tend to sometimes flip from topic to topic and don't focus on it. I, I know people who have basically 40 years later are doing the same work they did in graduate school, and they're often immensely successful. And that sort of success will, never, will always elude me because I like moving from topic to topic. And I find so much of psychology interesting so that when I was a professor at University of Arizona, I decided to teach my first intro psych course. It reviews everything, Freud, Skinner, the brain, neuroscience, clinical psychology, social psychology, the whole shebang. And I moved to Yale in 99, taught the course every year when I was at Yale. And now I'm at University of Toronto, continue to teach it. So one answer to why me is that I really have a lot of experience teaching intro psych and I decided to turn it into a book. Not a textbook, not a book for classes, but a book that anybody could read. Maybe the second answer is I've always had smart friends. So I have smart friends and students and colleagues. And when there's stuff I don't know much about, 
take clinical psychology. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a shrink. But I know a lot of people who are. So I wrote my chapter and I sent it off to five friends and they ripped it apart and said, everything you said was true up to six months ago. This has been changed. You're wrong here. I think through all this, I came up with a book, which I'm fairly proud of. There are critics out there in general of psychology. I can think of somebody who I respect his work, Nassim Talib. He will jump on psychologists left and right. But I would have to say, after doing this podcast for 10 years, and I've had quite a few people on this podcast, peers, names you know, and are some of my most favorite conversations, because I think it's ultimately a conversation. It's the give and take. It's the what morsel can we learn here? What angle can we take here? Versus being so dogmatic especially about a subject, psychology, the mind, where it's tough to be dogmatic. There's always another angle. There's always another vantage. Some of my most favorite conversations on this podcast. Speak to the term psychology, though. Speak to this term, because some people, they will hear it and they will just immediately, oh, I've never been to a psychologist or that's just some professor on campus. But okay, I just laid out my perspective. But bring people into that might be a little bit of a critic or a skeptic Bring them in. How do you bring people like that into your world? So you talked about Taleb and other people who will jump up and down on psychology and criticize it. I'm happy to do that, too. I have a chunk of my book on the crisis, which is, um, I'm, I think you're probably pretty familiar with it, but people who aren't, a lot of our findings don't replicate. And this is kind of shocking. And it's because we've been doing our studies wrong. We've been guilty of what some is called p-hacking, which is we've been opportunistically doing statistical analyses and publishing those that work and throwing away those that don't. And that's just one of many problems of psychology. It's a human endeavor. Any human endeavor, we sometimes really mess up and we do it wrong and we fail. And if somebody wants to point and say, that research is really awful, I might look at the research and say, you're totally right. Even research that a lot of people respect. One reason why this book isn't a textbook is because although I try to tell the standard story of the field, I often go and I say, yeah, this theory doesn't seem very hot. And this research is actually not as respectable as you think it is. I'm very happy to be critical. But what I'll also say to the skeptic is, we have had some tremendous success stories. We have learned amazing things about the mind. We've learned about the incredible early capacities of babies and children. We've learned about the strange fragility of memory, how fragile memory is and how easy it is to implant false memories in people. We've learned about the surprising role of genes in your personality and intelligence. We've learned some surprising things about happiness, about language, about consciousness. So in some way, you can judge us by our failures, but also judge us by our successes. On this podcast a few years back, I had Alison Gopnik on talking about her concept of Bayesian babies, which I thought was one of the most fascinating conversations I've had. And I'll give it to you as a jumping off point too, is that it really is an interesting distinguishing delineation between children and adults. Those children are like, hey, I'm going to go crawl over there. That looks interesting. Oh, wow, that is interesting. I'm going to keep crawling that way. I'm going to keep going that way. Whereas adults... Back to that word, the mind, adults will start to build walls and protective barriers to keep them from failing or falling down. Yeah, I'm a fan of Allison's work, and I talk about some of it in my book. And the difference between children and adults is endlessly fascinating. You could ask the question as sort of a cognitive psychologist, how do they think differently? But even the conscious experience, whenever I encounter a baby, and long ago when I had some, you stare into their faces and you wonder, what the hell is going on? You're staring at each other, and you could be staring at a Martian or an AI, or whatever. The difference between the minds of children and adults is fascinating. This is actually a nice case where you see agreement and controversy. So I'm more sympathetic than Allison, and again, we're friends, big fan, about the idea that babies have a lot of stuff pre-wired. I'm somewhat skeptical about her ideas that babies are super creative. I see real creativity emerging much later when a lot more stuff is in place. But one of the things I like about Allison's work, which I think extends to psychology in general, is how cross-disciplinary it is, in that it brings together developmental psychology with feels like philosophy and feels like mathematical modeling, logic, computer science, AI. Most of the best work in psychology doesn't stay in its lane, and it's exciting for that reason. Since your work takes me around to so many different places, I'm going to take you around to a lot of different places. The book invites that. I've written books that argue a single focus thing, and then you can talk about that forever. This book is, I will admit, all over the place. Let's go into something that can open us up to some topical examples, perhaps, but the idea of morality. Give me some perspective on morality, specifically whether you think it's inherent, whether there's some inherent genetic component to morality. I do. 
I do for two reasons. One reason is by the logic of evolution. We're social creatures. It would be bizarre if we didn't evolve some means of dealing with one another, some sense of attachment to kin and to people we're in close interaction with. So it's not surprising to find some inkling of morality in people. Primatologists like Franz de Waal see some inkling of it in non-human primates like chimpanzees. So that's the theory. The data, and I've been involved in some of the collection of data, finds that even before a child's first birthday, they're surprisingly moral creatures. They want to help. They can judge good characters and bad characters. We, show, we do experiments where we show little plays of a character helping another and another character harming another. And we find that babies prefer the one that helps and don't like the one that harms. Later on, they want to punish bad agents. I think that there's a foundation of morality that's universal species in all of our species. And that's part of the story. But the other part of the story, which I think sometimes we forget about, is how much of morality is a discovery, I think. So however smart babies are, they don't know slavery is wrong. They don't know that racism and sexism is wrong. They don't have complicated intuitions about human rights and animal rights and all of that. So in morality, we see the perfect combination of a hardwired innate system and enormous cultural growth. And I think you had Steve Pinker on a while ago, and Steve talks very eloquently about how moral progress has occurred over many centuries and made us more and more moral beings. And that's not hardwired. It's not controversial in my mind to ask this, but these days, it seems like anything that you get that's too close to the heat is controversial. But when you mention it, we talk about morality. I'm in Asia. After being in Asia for 10 years, I don't want to be dogmatic. I don't want to be emphatic. But I feel like the way, generally speaking, that Asian people interact with each other, and I've seen far less violence than I could ever imagine to see in America these days that you start to say, well, gosh, this particular group of people, and obviously there's all kinds of different countries in Asia, but there's a lot of similarities. This particular group of people has evolved in a way that's different than the different groups that make up, let's say, America have evolved. And I find that fascinating because it's one of those conversations where people, the way that I frame that to you, I could see somebody saying, oh my gosh, that sounds a little racist. But I find it very interesting as a Caucasian man in Asia singing the praises of Asian culture. Yeah, I'm comfortable with judgment calls. I'm a moral realist. So just like you could say, this society has better science than that society. They understand things better. They have better medicine. You could really say this society does morality better than other societies. You look at Nazi Germany, and they had a morality, and it was a really messed up morality. I'm totally comfortable as to saying one group does it better than another, and we should if we're not that group that does it better, we should become that group. This gets us to the cultural part of morality. There's a very crude distinction people sometimes make between individualistic societies like the United States and collectivist societies like much of Asia. These societies do morality differently. You could make it more fine-grained. A lot of the United States, not all of it, has a morality that's rooted in what's called culture of honor, which is a very moralistic culture, but it demands strict divisions between men and women. And it basically says, if I disrespect you, you can't ignore it. You can't turn the other cheek. You got to punch me in the nose. You got to teach me who's boss. You look at all of these societies and you find strengths and weaknesses. In some cases, what makes it hard, again, I don't have any objections to say one's better than another, but what makes it hard to make the choice in actuality is that there are trade-offs sometimes. I spend a bit of time in Singapore. And Singapore is also an extremely safe society and everything. But one of the trade-offs they make is they have much less of a moral value and freedom of expression and freedom of speech. And in some way, they say, this is how we get along so much. There was, at the time I was there, about 10 years ago, I think, blasphemy laws. And there are no blasphemy laws in the States. And personally, I'm very much against blasphemy laws. But I understand what's going on, which is that people don't chafe at each other. They don't offend each other so much. You could see morality as a system with many dials. And you could turn these different dials. But there are consequences which lead to sometimes improvement in one domain and decrease of value in another domain. Do you see in the Asia morality, are you worried at all about less of a priority on rights? That's kind of a legal versus culture issue, where it seems like to me that culture rules. I've never seen any violence in Vietnam. That doesn't mean there is no violence, but I've never seen any. I was just back in America for 30 days, and you can see pretty quickly. So it's an interesting question. It's not rooted in law that these rights are there, but it's like the people give it to each other more on a cultural level. 
I should ask too, because I think some of my audience would probably snap back at me if I didn't say it, because you're right about Singapore and I'm thinking about Thailand too, China. I've seen myself censored if I go to a particular web page or whatnot. But on the flip side, I just caught some headlines the other day where the former Twitter staff was before Congress and much of the issue is about censorship. So that becomes a real conundrum these days is we like to think at least Americans and the way that I grew up taking several law classes, that free speech is an absolute, but that sure looks like it's changed in America too. That's right. So we see cultural changes. There are surveys of college students, for instance, that find often a majority or at least a lot say it is fine to shut up a speaker if what they're saying hurts the sensibilities of fellow students. Which would have blown you away 20 years ago if you heard that. You would have been like, what? It honestly would have, particularly among the left. The left during, let's say, the 60s were the free speech absolutist. That's right. The right were censorious. They were all into banning books and shutting up people and very worried about disrespect to institutions. Now, certainly the right remains censorious. I don't want to get too deep dive into American politics, but the current governor of Florida is setting up some pretty strict speech restrictions on campuses. You can't talk about diversity. You can't talk about this view or that view. But you're right. More and more the left is highly invested in shutting people up. And these are different moral views. I can put on a moralist hat, and I'm very, very happy to do this and tell you, I'm really pro-free speech. I think societies thrive when there's not an unlimited amount of free speech, but when there's much more than we currently have, regardless of the offense it causes people. But when I put on a psychologist hat, I say, isn't it interesting that people have different intuitions about this? It's not like one side is angels and another is psychopaths. Rather, we come from it from honest moral views. The people who want to shut you up for saying certain things are not bad people. They just work on a different moral code. And what's interesting too is when you use the word people, if we dove a little bit deeper and we looked at, let's say, the differences between men and women when it comes to thinking through all of these issues, there's probably going to be very distinct differences. There's, in fact, some studies that show exactly that difference. College women are, on average, more concerned about people's suffering and people's feeling that they're respected and corresponding less concerned about the rights of people to say controversial and ugly things. One answer to being a pluralist is that these are two moral perspectives that are both worth taking seriously, maybe not even at the level of law. But if you constantly say things that just make other people feel horrible, I think it's perfectly good morality to say you're doing something bad. Maybe the law should permit you to do so, but still. Obviously, I've got a distinct bias being a male, but it is interesting for me to observe. But if I observe younger guys in their 20s and 30s, and I try to keep myself in tune to the pulse my observation, adding to what you were saying about women of that age, men are very much of a libertarian, classical, liberal mindset. And you can see the headbutting between men and women. That's right. And you can see the headbutting between the young and the old who have different views. This is sort of optimism, but I'm all into the headbutting. There's multiple moral values that are worth taking seriously. And I think in a good society, people fight them out and work to see which one's preferable. You're spot on. I only hope, though, if we stay at the headbutting, back to your point that you made about free speech, let's headbutt, but let's don't censor the headbutting. Let the intellectual fight, so to speak, play out. I linked to a CDC report last year on Facebook, and I didn't think it was anything controversial. I'm not a flamethrower on the last couple of years, but it was just a simple report. And <laughs> Mr. Zuckerberg took it down and suspended me. I was like, okay, I don't want to play on this platform anymore. And it was the first time in my life that somebody said, no, you can't do that on a simple thing of speech where I was not hurting anybody. That shocked me. Yeah. I think that free speech is a value for exactly that reason that stands in some way above all other values, because it's the value that allows for the interchange of values. So I say, let everybody argue it and fight it out and see which arguments prevail. But if you say, I'm not permitted to talk about Palestine, I'm not permitted to give a view about trans people or about unions or about gay rights or whatever, on whatever side, I'm just not permitted, the necessary process doesn't happen. Keeping us on our focus of the mind, if you have populations, whatever side they're on, of whatever issue, if you have populations that feel like they're being compressed, they feel like they're being held in, well, then other things might happen. They might take bad actions that maybe never would have happened if they just could have been allowed to speak. 
I think that's right. I'm mindful about paradoxical effects. And I see a lot of this. You're in Vietnam, I'm in Canada, but we keep going back to the States to give examples. Mm -hmm. But the rise of populist movements in the States, particularly of Trump, I think has a little bit of dynamic you're talking about, where a large group of very angry people say, you're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to believe that. We're going to fire you if you do. We're going to take you off social media. We're going to censor you. And the response isn't acquiescence. It isn't, oh, okay, I guess I'm making a big mistake. I won't do this anymore. It's fighting back. A lot of people, I think, again, paradoxically, one reason why there's often a very ugly speech and ugly actions on a part of populist movements is because they're rebelling against people trying to shut them up. I think in general, being critical, but giving people some space to air their views is often a good way to teach them that their views may be wrong. You mentioned it earlier, just in passing, the trans moment that we're living in, the topic of the day that most of the world is not trans must debate and discuss nonstop. But that also seems to be another one of these issues. If you say, okay, the Trump side over here, they're pushing hard. But on the other side, it seems like they're pushing hard too, perhaps because they're being pushed back on. Yeah. Everything's ratcheting up from all sides. It is a typical train wreck when you get into these sort of controversial issues with bizarre extremes. The most recent thing is I heard Donald Trump is saying or threatening that if he has the power, he will have a law effectively banning the existence of trans people. He will say the United States will only recognize the genders of male and female and assume that they are assigned at birth, which means that trans people will be effectively not recognized by the U.S. government. It's ridiculous and horrible. And of course, Trump is a masterful creature of the culture wars. So he knows that this is a shocking and ugly statement on his side, which will gather up his followers and lead to an incensed reaction on the other side. None of this is good for either politics or science. I'll take us out of the controversial Trump stuff, but I will add for the audience, let's say maybe half my audience approves and really thinks Trump is a good guy and he's pushing in the right areas. On the flip side to where you could point out that Trump is saying this, that he wants to ban I saw a lady the other day, she was attempting to register her kids for a private school, and she had a choice of 99 genders. And so it's very much, it's two sides, it seems like to me. It doesn't feel like it's one side. It feels like it's two sides duking it out. I think for just about every issue, you could have two sides. And it is not difficult, particularly now that we have Twitter. One of the horrible brothers of Twitter is you could easily find stupid views on either side. I'm interested in sex and gender, and I do not think there are 99 genders. On the other hand, I would distinguish sex from gender, which is really important to do so. The idea that there's more than two genders seems to be pretty compatible with how people live their lives. So it doesn't freak me out that there are non-binary people who don't identify with either gender. Some of this, people were, oh, it's a scam, it's a trick, they're making fun of me and everything. But honestly, there are people who, in their inclinations and feelings, don't really feel that they're a man or a woman. And as a psychologist, you observe this, you say, is this real? And it seems to be real. I won't keep you there because we could <laughs> fall off on that. Let me take it to a big picture issue and just get your initial perspective when I put this phrase out, nature versus nurture or nurture versus nature. When you hear that as a psychologist, as someone who's been in the field for a long time, what is your perspective? Just to share with you, my perspective would generally be, it sure looks like there is some genetic component to success. You can see this, let's say, from father to son in particular groups, but there's no doubt, and I've met them, there's no doubt that people have been trained or learned their way into a particular life success. How do you look at it? I look at it similarly. I think talk of nature versus nurture makes some people kind of silly. And the silly side to me is saying, oh, they're all one. There's no distinction. But plainly, there is. The color of my eyes is nature. It's programmed by my genes. The fact that I know all of the plots of all the John Wick movies is nurture because I went to them and I learned them is not universal. So many things in life are an interaction between the two, but that doesn't mean the two aren't real. One thing is you want to talk about personality differences and talents and success, exactly the interaction that you have, that you talk about exists, and it's not hard to see. And there are two parts of it. I think only an extreme radical, someone who's actually really wrong, would deny that there are gifts, that some people come into the world with musical gifts or mathematical gifts, or just gifts of high intelligence or good personal skills and so on. The evidence for the heredity of these things is very strong. If I want to know basically how introverted you are, 
I could learn a lot by finding your biological mother and biological father, finding out how introverted they are, even if they never raised you. That's one thing. But then, of course, the environment plays an enormous role. Suppose Einstein became Einstein because of his great cognitive gifts. Well, if Einstein was raised in a war-torn part of Africa, never got to go to school, never got to leave his village, he would not have been Einstein. And so the question is, the implication is, there's an enormous number of Einsteins and Mozarts and whatever all around the world who, due to bad environments, never get to have their gifts flourish. To add to that, too, there is a significant number of people that have gifts and for whatever personal reason, for example, I can think of an associate, let's just say, she grew up in a situation where she was tested high IQ early in life. So she ended up in the magnet schools and all of her friends there, girlfriends, all high IQ. And then 20, 30 years later, none of them took on the big life challenges. They just fell back into, and they all had a situation where there was plenty of opportunity and family structure and family money. So they were not somewhere in Africa with a bad social structure. And they just chose not to. They had the gifts, so to speak. But then again, here's where it gets tricky. The IQ alone might not be a gift alone. Right. And there's different things that work here. Some things are, you might have groups of people who have some degree of intellectual gifts, but the motivations are a different story. Probably to be very successful in life for everything, you need both high intelligence, but also what Angela Duckworth describes as grit or conscientiousness and so on. And without that, you may not go very far. But your example is actually good for another reason, which is that you don't have to go to another country to make the point. Not so long ago, and still to some extent, the world has basically been wasting the talents, abilities, and potential of roughly half the population, because the strictures on women and women's possibilities are very strong, and certainly were much, much stronger. The fact that Einstein had a penis played a surprising large role in his success. There are times not so long ago where women were not admitted into universities, for instance as well as times not so long ago where the restrictions say on how many Jews a university would take in the United States. So when we talk about gifts, we have to realize these gifts are run through a societal filter where some people are just filtered out because of their ethnicity, their sex, and so on. And there's nature and nurture. Women have played catch up quick though, because I believe most college campuses have got a majority of women as undergrads and grads these days. I think that's a fair statement. So it's turned around fairly quickly in the last, let's say, less than 50 years, at least in North America, perhaps Europe too. It is a fair statement, and it's not subtle. I think in some places like 60% women undergraduates, so that many universities are very quietly doing affirmative action or diversity, I guess, in favor of boys to try to even it out a little bit. And that's a fascinating question. It may be what we're seeing there is nature. It may be for various biological reasons. Women are more suited for that sort of thing than men. But I don't know. It could be culture. These things are hard to entangle, but they're very interesting to entangle in the sort of things we could do. I don't know where this will go with this example I'm going to give you. Having grown up in the D.C. area, I believe it is still the number one high school in the country. This is called Thomas Jefferson Magnet School. The kids in Fairfax County, Virginia, have the opportunity to take a test. I think seventh or eighth grade. It's merit only. You get the highest scores. Those kids get into the high school. And this started, I think, when I was in high school, went to high school in the area. Now, I guess 30 or 40 years later the administrators did not like where the demographics went. And you already know where the demographics went. It's the similar case to the Harvard case with the Asian students. It was something like 70 to 80% of the kids in this magnet school were all of Asian ancestry. And the administrators have decided in the last year or two to change that and to go to a more subjective process. This is an interesting part of our modern life when it comes to the mind. I would be perfectly honest with you, my bias falls towards merit, even if that leaves me as a minority. I don't care. I want to see the kids that got the highest scores get in. At least that's my stance. People of your stance would draw an analogy, the people defending Harvard and other universities hate this analogy between how Asians are treated now and how Jews were treated many decades ago, where there were just too many Jews at Harvard. So the university decided that they're going to throw in some qualifications, roughly to the extent to which you're like a gentleman and you have all these other traits, made it so that they basically had fewer nerds and more well-rounded people, i.e. more Christian people. Well-rounded is a very subjective term, right? 
Yes. And the anti-Asian case, I think that there is often good justification for bringing other qualifications besides academic excellence for getting into university. But you and I have common ground in that. I think a lot of the anti-Asian sentiment, just to take this example, is really ugly. Yeah. When people look deep in this, what the universities often say to themselves, to each other in admissions rooms, isn't like, oh, we hate Asians. It's more, well, they're such nerds. They're so boring. They're all alike. They're featureless, which is a tremendously ugly stereotype. That sounds very racist. It does sound very racist. It is interesting. And again, tells us something about human nature that the same ugliness arises over time, just often in different contexts. But having said all that, I also think merit is extremely important. I think some of the abandoning of merit in various places is disappointing and have bad effects. But there are arguments for other considerations being tossed in. I never felt this sort of has to be a logical truth that Harvard has to accept the top academic people. They accept athletes. They accept musicians. They accept legacies. And the idea of having some diversity for gender, for ethnicity, doesn't seem to be incredibly flawed to me. It's just there's a balancing act that's important. And I think the balance has gone too much to the other side. So for you and I to have this conversation is like flip you around a little bit. 86 billion neurons are pulsating through our gray matter right now to allow us to communicate these thoughts, to express these ideas, to bat the tennis ball back and forth over the net. 86 billion neurons. Is that accurate? Yep, that's the number. I used to say 100 billion. But now what happened was I'm a neuroscientist. She put brains. The problem is they used to sample parts of brains. But different brains have different neural densities. So she did something pretty clever. She took a whole brain and put it in a blender, blended it all up to this fine puree, then took a random sample from the blender, figured out how many neurons were there, extrapolated, you get 86 billion. <laughs> it's just phenomenal because here we are in the last, it feels like just the last one month where all these AI products are coming online and everyone's playing with AIs and whatnot. But we're the ultimate AI. Maybe we are AI. We don't even know, do we? Do you mean whether we were created by somebody else? Well, that's the question, right? <laughs> that's the question that takes our podcast for the next week, right? No, I'm a Darwinian. Existence of other creatures, the evolutionary records suggest, I'm not qualified to say whether we were seeded, DNA was seeded at some point in the past, but- Like Prometheus, right? Exactly. But I think it's pretty clear that we are natural intelligence, if anything is. We've evolved through natural selection. And so many of our strengths and weaknesses, including the moral ones we talk about, only make sense from an evolutionary point of view. But yeah, at least up to now, at least up to 2023, our cognitive abilities far outstrip any other creature, natural or artificial on the planet. Come back in 50 years and who knows? I think I asked this question of one of your peers, I don't recall who, on this podcast before. But as we think about evolution, we think about us, the Homo sapiens. Will there ever be a divergence? Will we all keep going the same direction? The fossil record that we have shows tree branches that went one way, then stopped and broke off. And we can see back that I think there's a small island down in Indonesia. We think there might have been a close relative living maybe 10 or 20,000 years ago. What's your perspective on that? Will there be a tree branch of Homo sapiens or will we stay our group going forward? These are unusually fun questions for this sort of thing. I like the question. <laughs> Since evolution takes such a long time period, the scenario where I could see what you're describing coming to be is interstellar space travel. Mm. So while we're on Earth, we're going to keep mating with each other and there's going to be no species division. That would take so long and such separation. On the other hand, imagine an intrepid bunch of colonizers fly off to some planet around Alpha Centauri or something, or much, much further, and then colonize the planet, and then half a million years go by. Given the accidental and somewhat sort of arbitrary nature of evolutionary change, it could be at the end of half a million years if they were to meet again, the Earthlings and the people that are sort of future aliens, they would be a uh, different species. Does that make sense? That's the sort of split I can imagine. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, because you could imagine maybe the atmosphere could be slightly different. Everything could be slightly different, and there's no telling what could happen. Exactly. And maybe that's a half a billion year scenario. With genetic engineering, there's at least a potential of speciating ourselves on purpose, creating a separate species. I'm not sure why anybody would want to do it. It's going to get tough to get past ethics committees and human subjects committees, but it's at least, if we're talking science fiction, that's another science fiction scenario. Yeah, that could end up being a messy movie if things don't go the right direction. 
That's right. I think I've seen that movie. I mentioned it just a second ago, but I brought up AI and specifically some of these Google-like interfaces where you can ask a question. And some of the current AI seems to have, a lot of people that I know have said, oh, that's really cool. It answers questions that I had some real difficulty with and some very smart people I know. And then I've also seen the examples where some of the political or social questions are asked and you can see, okay, I know who the programmers of this particular AI were, I know what their bias was. Yep. What do you make of what's going on with the AI right now as we contrast it to our mind? Because I guess in a way, the current AIs, even though some aspects might be beyond us and some might be crude and inferior, but it's also a form of a mind, isn't it? It's something. I have a lot of friends who are very skeptical about, ah, it's no big deal. I think it's an extremely big deal. We've forgotten the fact that just a few years ago, something you could have a conversation with seemed forever beyond our grasp. And now you have chat GPT, which can do extraordinary things instantaneously. I give it an argument in one of my books and say, give me three possible counter arguments and boom, in a fraction of a second, there they are. It has its problems, its big problems. It is often humorously woke in certain ways. I once asked it just playfully to test its limits. Who suffered more, Jews or Blacks in America? And then I said, oh, I can't answer that. Then I figured it couldn't. But then I gave it different scenarios. And finally, I said, who suffered more? Someone who suffered a lot versus someone who never suffered. And I said, oh, I can't answer that. You can't compare suffering. So it has these weird blocks on it. I think a deeper problem is it doesn't seem very tethered to truth. So I have a lot of scientist friends who ask it questions and it will make up stuff. It'll make up references. It will try to please you. So I think it has this flaws. I don't think it's anywhere near the sort of thing we could ask the question, is it conscious? Is it sentient? But I don't know where it's going in 10 years. What do you think? You work in finance. You're very much in that world. 10 years from now, how is it going to shape your world? Is it going to put you out of business? I don't think so, because there's so many competing concerns that control the monies of people. Now, the younger generations that have fallen in love with crypto and Bitcoin, they're much more skeptical of a JP Morgan or a Goldman Sachs or a Charles Schwab. But a lot of assets are in the hands of gatekeepers and asset guiders and competing strategies for investment, private equity, venture capital. It's quite a system on top of all of this capital. Now, I think if that type of system didn't exist, then I think that people would be able to take advantage. It's like the middleman concept. There's all these middlemen separating people and their money. If the middlemen were not there, then I think you're probably right. That there'd be a lot more opportunity. If it's never going to hurt someone like me, because my existence has been pretty much just giving people insights and sharing on this yeah. podcast and books and stuff, very similar to you in a way. But yeah, I think if there was no middleman, that the AI revolution would be great. And look, everybody's going to fight against it. Doctors, attorneys, accountants, who wants to give away their job to some one computer? Yeah. But an analogy which keeps coming to mind is travel agents. I'm old enough to remember when I wanted to go on a trip to Europe. You go to a travel agent, you go downtown, you meet, talk to them, they go to flights, they print you out the tickets and everything. And now I'm sure there are some for certain things, but... Now it's just a web page. It's just Expedia or Kayak or whatever. I wonder to what extent so many of the things you're talking about, these professional jobs, they'll just be web pages. It'll be AIs that do it for you. And finance is interesting because I have conflicting feelings, which on one hand, I kind of want to deal with a person and not an AI because you can trust people. But on the other hand, I might trust an AI more than a person. Back to the point that some of your peers have made about truth, assuming that we have tested it enough that we can believe in the truth. Staying in AI, but shifting it to relationships and love and the mind for a second, it does feel like to me that maybe one of the first ways that we might see, given the crude nature of AI, but the crude nature of AI is more than acceptable for those people that are, let's say, lonely or unhappy to have the robot friends, so to speak. I would think the AIs might be already smart enough for a significant part of the population to be a friend. Yeah. I was wondering if you're going to get into the ever interesting topic of sex robots, but we'll stick with a... Yeah, that's in there too. I mean, that's coming. There's a guarantee it's coming. It's both a technological question and a psychological question. Technological question is, can these AIs, and here's physical stuff, which is often more difficult than computational stuff, can they make convincing sexual or romantic partners physically? 
and can they make convincing friends online or convincing therapists for that matter? The psychological question is, will we be satisfied with these things given that we know that they're artificial? I have a friend of mine, actually a colleague of mine who studies incels, typically men who feel rejected by women who feel lonely and bitter. And many people have said, well, these machines are the solution to that problem, to this dissatisfaction, the solution to loneliness. But if what the men want is to feel valued, then maybe giving them a machine, or here's, here's an app, talk to that, won't do it. It has yet to be valued by people. We're going to be coming up against in the next decade over and over again for art, for music, for sex, for therapy. The question of how much does it matter whether you're dealing with a person or with a machine? I think it's going to come down also, it's going to be some will be satisfied and some will never be. There's going to be some delineation that we don't know how that will break, but I'm sure some people will be satisfied. They'll love it. I want to add something too, because I think, again, I got to play devil's advocate here. Some of the audience, they might hear you use the term incel. There might be some people out there that are listening that think, hold on, that's a positive word to me. I think one interesting thing, I saw a documentary not too long ago called The Tender Swindler, I believe. And the interesting thing I think about if this is a potential reason for why there are young men that are feeling left out or not fitting in or women don't accept them or whatnot, but these dating apps are creating this interesting flow to where the 5 or 10% of the guys that the girls think are Brad Pitt are getting 90% of the attention from the women. And so whereas back at the farm, maybe people would have matched up in the small town, today these apps are creating as we talk about the human mind, are creating a really interesting conundrum in the human mind of both men and women. If we've got these guys that are falling down over here that we're calling incels that are feeling left out, if the majority of women are chasing the minority of what they perceive to be the potential Brad Pitt, that's not going to end up well either. Yeah, I agree. There's an author of a book, I think it was called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution that came out recently, where she argued that these apps like Tinder and the general culture around them is actually damaging to women whose sexual psychologies are different from men. And most women don't enjoy random hookups to the extent that men do, but also damaging to the vast majority of men who are unsuccessful in the mating market. It's the Brad Pitts who are totally delighted in the world of Tinder <laughs> because they get older random hookups. But the rest of us ordinary Joes are kind of in trouble. I don't think incel is ever a good word because under one version of it, it refers to a set of terrible people who have terrible attitudes and so on. Terrorists, whatnot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Under a broader set, which is what you're pointing to, and I respect that, it means those who are involuntarily celibate. But nobody wants to be involuntarily celibate. I think your point, which is nice, is in that broader sense, these people, including men, including women, including overrepresented by minorities, by the way, in the United States, including East Asians, deserve sympathy and help and care and not derision and ridicule and hatred. I've always found it pretty puzzling that the people who have tremendous sympathy for those who are poor often have real hatred or dislike scorn for those who are unattractive, who other people shun. I just think most people, if they were offered to trade, which would you rather be? Would you rather be poor but loved with sex and romance and people who just care for you and respect you? Or would you rather be rich and desperately lonely? I think they'd choose poor and loved every time. You bring up a great point, which is ultimately for us to have a conversation like this, we can touch on all these topics, but perhaps the positive thing to think about is what does it all come down to, which is we want our mind to be happy. We can touch on all these issues, but ultimately we can find inconsistencies in these things, but finding a happy mind is ultimately the goal, I think. I think that's true with a suitably broad definition of happy. First thing, we often want to know things and understand things just to know them. Figuring out know, the secrets of language processing isn't going to make me happy in any simple sense, but I really want to know. It might make you happy, though, in the sense to go to, I know he recently passed, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, the flow state. So you're engrossed in your topic. You're getting all kinds of chemical rushes from that engrossment. So I should clarify myself here in terms of happiness. Like right now, okay, I think we're both sufficiently engaged in this conversation that some nice release happens. That's a whole nother week-long conversation with you. The release that happens from being happy, from being engaged, engrossed. No, that's right. That's a good distinction. 
then I think we're saying the same thing then, which is there's value in this. I'm really enjoying this. But it's not in the same sense I'm enjoying a hot foot Sunday or a good back massage. It's not that sort of thing. It's not, or sex. That's right. That's right. <laughs> sex with a human, not a robot. Yes. Yes. Or at least if it's a robot, I can't tell. <laughs> okay. Blade Runner. But I end my book with a chapter on happiness and everything we know about happiness. And I push a pluralistic view, which says the good life involves pleasure. But it also involves flow and engagement. It involves being a good person. Morality it involves meaningful activities. And I think this is what makes the good life. And actually, I think psychology has learned a little bit about that. So to go back to what we were talking about, the insults and everything, there's a lot we debate about. But one thing that's pretty clear is that social relationships are super important for happiness, no matter how you define it. There's a recent science paper that said that the effects of being lonely are on a par with the effects of being obese and being a heavy smoker. The effects on your body, let alone on your soul. Figuring out what people need to flourish, I agree, could be like the primary program of psychology. And then as a society and as individuals, we have to sort of work out how could we set up our world so that people do flourish. Great stuff, Paul. I could pick your mind for hours and hours and hours. Very cool. Thank you. Well, have me back. Yes, absolutely. The book, Psych, The Story of the Human Mind, we have only just scratched the surface and I've bounced you around. But like I said, you bounce me around in your work. So it's only fair to take you to, <laughs> to inside my mind. That's what you get on a conversation like this. You walk away and you go, okay, what's going on inside that guy's mind? I'm not really sure. Maybe, <laughs> hopefully he's okay. Hopefully he doesn't have a robot over there somewhere in Asia. Paul, where can we send people beyond Amazon for the book and all that kind of stuff? People can find you online. Is there a particular website you want to direct people to? Yeah, I have a paulbloom.net has information about all my books and what I'm up to and good stuff like that. What keeps you motivated? Why do you want to keep going? What is the motivation? So I'm again, a pluralist. There's all sorts of things I wanted in my life. I have a family. I have two fantastic kids. In this case, what keeps me motivated for this is it goes back to what you said about flow. I love the feeling of intellectual engagement. I actually, in some complicated way, because it's always more fun to be checking your email, but I like writing books. I like meeting with my colleagues, my students and planning experiments. I like going to scientific conferences. I love this stuff. I'm always kind of shocked when people say, oh, I'm going to retire at a point or so on, because for better or worse, this is the stuff that I just crazy about. There's a line attributed to Freud. He didn't really say it, but it's a good line that everything that matters in life could be reduced to love and work and love you broadly family, friends, romance, and work is something that you dive into, you pursue, you feel flow at. And I think that that's very wise. And that's my answer to your question. Great stuff, Paul. Again, I think you said paulbloom.net, right? That's right. Cool. Paul, keep me posted on future work. I'd love to have you back on. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.